almost to the holiday season, which is my favorite time of the year. The song is true. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Um, there's just nothing like this season. The weather's different. It's colder. You can wear a jacket, um, sweater. I enjoy all of the decorations. There is nothing like Christmas decorations. There are, they're all over the place in houses. They're on, in stores. Everybody is, you know, putting snowmen and Charlie Brown characters all on their lawn. Um, I enjoy the music. There's nothing like Christmas music. You can listen to all these different songs and different versions of the songs, and it's my most favorite time of the year to just play music that I've been waiting to listen to for the entire year. It's also a time for Christmas movies. There is nothing like Christmas movies, The Grinch and Home Alone, and It's a Wonderful Life, and all these shows, and you, and you get next to the fire. Or if you don't have a, a fireplace, you get next to the fake fireplace. So if you don't have a <laughs> fake fireplace, maybe you get next to the stove, and you just you drink hot cocoa and you watch movies. There's nothing, there's nothing like that. And then the cherry on the top is the presents. And as I have gotten older, I have learned Christmas is not about presents. It's about Jesus. And presents. <laughs> you get stuff for free. Who wouldn't like that? So I'm really, really excited. And for me, the holiday season, you know I have a rule. You can't sing any Christmas songs until the last bite of Thanksgiving dinner. Once that happens, you can play all the Christmas music you want and start to wrap your gifts and all of that. So I see this week as sort of the runway into the holiday season, and Thanksgiving is sort of the launch point or the takeoff into the holiday season. We've got to get to Thanksgiving, go through Thanksgiving to get to the holiday season. And I'm, I'm really excited. I love Thanksgiving. I think all of us probably love Thanksgiving because we like to eat. We like, now is it just me? Is cranberry sauce only sold during this time? Yeah. No? Okay. Because I, I, we never eat cranberry sauce. Anybody else eat cranberry sauce any other time of the year? Okay, okay, maybe it's just, I thought it was just me. But it's, it's something about, you know, Thanksgiving and the turkey and cranberry sauce and stuffing and all, this, all these different foods. Um, but growing up in our family, we didn't have a time where everybody stood around and said what they were thankful for. We just prayed and we just ate. Because I think that's the smart thing to do when there's a bunch of food in front of you. It's just, let's just get down to business and, and eat. But Thanksgiving, I know they say all the time, you know, we're supposed to be thankful all year. But I do think it's good for us to have a set amount of time to go overboard with the thanks. Because if you're, if you're like me, you know that during the year, you probably don't give thanks as much as you should. And so as I was thinking this, this week about what, what am I thankful for? What, what is it that I could say that I am thankful for? And as I thought about it, there are probably a thousand and one things that you can think of. Probably you know what I'm thankful for, but I, I, you might not know what I'm thankful for. Because today, my heart, I think, is in sync with the Apostle Paul's heart. The Apostle Paul, I would say, if it was me, you say, oh, I'm thankful for my kid who's crying right now. Or for my wife, or for my family, or for my house, or for all those things. I'm thankful for all those things. But you know what I'm thankful for today? I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for you. And I, I want to talk about this from Colossians chapter 1. So if you brought a Bible, go with me to Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to be in verses 3, 4, and 5. Colossians chapter 1, 3, 4, and 5. Again, if you're new, you don't have a Bible, we put it up on the screen for you so you can follow along with us. Colossians chapter 1 and verses 3 through 5. If you have it, say, I got it. If you see it, say, I see it. All right, we're going to read verses 3, 4, and 5. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. The faith and hope, sorry, the faith and love that spring from the hope 
that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel. This morning, I am thankful for you. Every year, we go down to Southern California for a worship conference, and this worship conference has worship leaders and leaders from all over the world, from big churches, small churches, medium-sized churches. And the thing I love about these times is we get to worship with other Christians, other pastors, other worship leaders, and you get to hear stories about what it is that they're going through at their church. And every year, without fail, every time I go, I always, my heart always turns back to you because when I'm there, they tell me about their congregation and their people. Let me tell you, there are congregations and people in some congregations that I would not want to be pastor of. You think you, you've heard criticism? People were telling me they bring, you know, they have these notes that they would have. You have suggestions. Every single week, somebody's bringing a suggestion. Every single week, somebody's complaining. Every single week, somebody's bringing an email about this. The music was too loud. This was too this. This was too that. And it's the same person on and on and on, just keeps going and going and going. And, and I thought, I said, you know, I don't have, we don't have anybody like that at our church. And I'm thankful for that. <laughs> My heart always turns back to you because you're, you're the church. You're the people that I love the most. And so when I'm down there and I'm thinking about, Lord, I'm so thankful for the people that you've given me to lead, the people you've given me to to preach to, to love on. I'm so thankful for you. But what am I thankful for? Number one, as Paul said, I'm thankful for your faith in Christ Jesus. See, some of you in this room, you might not know, but some people in this room, they used to be on drugs, literally on drugs controlled by drugs and now today they are controlled by the spirit and worshiping God in a building designed for his glory. There are people who are in our church who have been in our church who have been sexually immoral every weekend, every day, every month, day after day, sexually immoral. And now that they are saved, they're married and they stay with that one person that they're married to. And they, if they're single, they're celibate. Yes. Because they've been saved. There are people in our church who have been prostitutes, who have given themselves to strangers, given their bodies to strangers, and now give their bodies as a living sacrifice to God. This is the work of God. When we say that God saves, this is not just a line of a song. It's a reality, and I'm thankful as I look out and I can see God has saved some of you. I've seen where you came from. I'm not even that old. I remember you the way you used to be. You think I don't remember when I was younger? I didn't tell, but I saw what you did. And it it reminds me of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You don't have to turn there. Just listen to what he says. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. You would expect Paul to say, and those are the people that are out there. Those are the people outside the walls. Those people are not inheriting the kingdom of God. But then what does he say right after that? He says, and that is what some of you were. See, in the church of Corinth, there were people who were ex-prostitutes, ex-adulterers, ex-homosexual offenders. And he says, that's what some of you were. But, he says, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. In other words, you have been saved, you have been changed. And as you're reading that, that, you know, that, that passage where it says, you know, sexually immoral, adulterers, and male prostitutes, and greedy, drunkards, you're just saying, check. Check, check, that was me, check, check. But know that all of of that has been wiped out by the eraser of the blood of Jesus. And so as you sit here this morning, I look at you and I'm so thankful that you are saved because some people thought you would never be saved. There are people right now that you're thinking, oh, they ain't never coming. Did you know some people used to think that about you? They are never coming. So I'm thankful for the fact that you are saved. 
I'm also thankful for your love for all the saints. Paul says to them, this is not a general love. It's agape. It's a sacrificial love. And it's for all the saints. It's, it's, see, it's easy to love some of the saints. It's a different story to love all of the saints. And he says this is a love. It's not in general. like to just love. It's to all of the saints. I'm thankful this morning for your love that you have for the people in this church. We tend to be, I think, tend to be a little bit more negative when it comes to this issue. We need more love. We need more. And that's true. We do need, we always, we need more of everything in the Bible. But I want to encourage you to look around and see what it is that God is actually doing. And see what he's actually doing. Let me, let me just give you a few things. Now, before I give you these, these few things, let me say that there, there's something I see on uh, social media that says something along these lines. It says, the church is full of hypocrites and judgmental people. Yes, but so is Costco. <laughs> and you don't say, right, well, I'm not going to Costco with them hypocritical, judgmental clerks. <laughs> See, now, correct me if I'm wrong, on our pamphlet, on our website, is there anything that says everybody who goes to this church is perfect? Everybody who goes to this church is always in a good mood. Everybody in this church is always says the right thing. Does it say that? No. So when people come to us, man, that church is just full of messed up people. Yes, that's what we want. But here's the problem. People look from the outside and think they understand what God is doing in this room. What God is doing in this room is he is changing us. God saves bad people. You, before you knew Christ, you were bad. In fact, you're worse than I know. You're worse than anybody. You know how bad you are. What, what if we put your thoughts this week on the screen? You, you're worse, you're worse than anybody else knows. And listen, God still loves you. That's real love. It's real love when you know everything about somebody and you still love them. And that's, see, that's what the church is about. I know, it's fake love if I'm like, oh man, she's always nice. I can love her. It's harder to love somebody you know is a difficult person. And I heard something the other week that says sometimes we think the enemy is just the person who's always trying to kill us. Sometimes it feels like the enemy is your wife. <laughs> and, the, and the Bible says love them. In that moment when you feel like, I feel like you are like my enemy. Or your, your son or your daughter or a co-worker or someone that you're cool with that you don't look at as an enemy. The Bible says you still need to love them. I talked with somebody the other week that says sometimes I just feel like I cannot get through to my significant other. I said, you know, the, the Bible calls you to love them. But here in this church, I want to give you a few examples of things that you may not know about. Did you know that there are people in this church who somebody needed help moving and they went to help them by themselves? They didn't send out a text. They didn't send out an email. So-and-so need help. They went by themselves to help this person move and they didn't broadcast it. They didn't tell anybody. They just went by themselves to help this person who had no help to move. Did you know that there are people in this church who will slip? There's probably been thousands of dollars put under the table, slip to people to help with gas, to help with groceries, to help with other expenses that you will never know about. People help to buy cars. People in this church, someone goes with them to the doctor to ask questions of the doctor to make sure that everything is going good, give them rides, pray with them, things that you would never know. People in this body who have helped people get jobs. Amen. There are a lot of people who just think, oh, man, the church is just full of judgmental, hypocritical people. And let me tell you, the church is full of people who love one another and who show love to other people. All sorts of things. Taking kids for the weekend. So a married couple can get away or so a single mom can regain her sanity. <laughs> Remember what Jesus said in John 13, 34, and 35? Do I remember? 
A new command I give you. <laughs> love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, how will the world know we are his followers, his students, his pupils? How will they know that? By our love for one another. People come into the church and they say, man, these people love each other and yet they look so different. See, the church is the one place where there's a bunch of people who look like they do not belong together. We don't look like we belong together. But we have something in common, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that binds us together. So I'm thankful this morning for your faith. I'm thankful this morning for your love. And it's interesting that um, the world is really looking for love. Mary J. Blige said, uh, I'm, I'm searching for uh, what? Real love. And it's interesting that she says in one of her lines, she says, so I try my best and pray to God he'd send me someone real. Now, I don't know if she's a Christian, but if she, if, if she was a, a Christian, God would send her to the church. Because the church is where she's going to find real love. Amen. Now, in the next line, she says, to caress me. <laughs> so I think that's a little inappropriate for, <laughs> for brothers and sisters in Christ. But, I mean, maybe you'll find the one to caress here. I don't know. I did, so. All right, so last... So I'm thankful this morning for your, your faith in Christ Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful this morning for your love for all the saints. And I'm also thankful for your hope. Look at again at Colossians chapter, <laughs> chapter 1, verse 5. And he says, this faith and this love, it springs from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you've already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel. In, in the Bible, hope can be subjective or it could be objective. There's a kind of hope that you have a desire that things kind of work out okay. And Paul uses that, uh, the word hope, that, that way sometimes. But more often, Paul uses hope as an objective. In other words, hope is not just this desire that you have for everything to work out okay. Hope is the desire or the confidence you put in a reality. And so you see Paul, for example, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 5, by f but by faith we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. There is, for us, we look forward to something that's rock solid. We're not just kind of wishing everything works out. We are confident that our, our hope is in Christ. In the surety of his resurrection, that he is alive and he is coming back to get us. We, are, we have a hope in that. And it's a different kind of hope than just, you know, kind of wishing. Think about it. Two kids at a, at a private school. And one kid says, my dad can beat up your dad. And the other kid says, my dad can beat up your dad. And then the one kid says, well, who's your dad? And he says, well, my dad's Tiger Woods. Who's your dad? He said, well, my dad's Mike Tyson. <laughs> And the kid who's in, who's uh, Tiger Woods saying, well, I hope my dad wins. And the other kid says, I hope my dad wins. Which one do you think hope is more sure? <laughs> Mike Tyson's son. Now, I don't know what year Mike Tyson was really, really good, but he, he kind of fell off. But you understand the point that our, our hope is not in these things that we see around us. Our hope is in Christ, and it's sure. And so for the Christian, listen, we look up in faith. And we look out with love. And we look forward with hope. And so that's what I'm thankful for this morning. I am thankful this morning for your faith. I am thankful this morning for your love. And I am thankful this morning that you have a hope. See, for the Christian, we're not, our, we're not putting all of our eggs into the basket of the world. We have a more sure hope that is waiting for us. He says here, in heaven, waiting for us. And that's what we're looking forward to. We're not looking forward to what this world can offer. The Bible says it, that moth gets it, rust gets it, thieves come in and steal. So put your treasure where it's not gonna, nobody's going to touch it. 
When you get to heaven, Jesus said, here it is, safe, ain't nobody touched it. And I think I might have even more joy than Paul had because Paul, he never met this church. He only, in fact, later he says, I only heard about this. So he didn't see it with his, with his eyes. He didn't feel it with his hands. He didn't experience it. But he heard about it. And that, and that caused him to have unbelievable joy. But I can tell you, I have seen it. I have experienced it. I can't tell you how many times somebody has slipped me some ranch sunflower seeds, Sour Patch Kids, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, a couple dollars, more than a couple dollars. I can't tell you how many times we have given to our pastor, given to people in need. I'm telling you, I have seen it and I have experienced it. I'm not just saying, oh, I heard about this church named Village Baptist Church and I heard that they do something. No, I, I've actually seen it with my eyes. Amen. And I am blessed by it. And so Paul, he was so, so affected by this that he said, I continually pray for you. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to pray for you and then send us on our way. Amen. So let us pray.